Social gatherings are one of the interesting features of his society, but there is a special event which stands out as the most unique gathering in the world. It is not the Muslim Hajj or the Hindu Kumbh Mela. Known as Arbaeen, it is the world's most populous gathering and you've probably never heard of it. Not only does the congregation exceed the number of visitors to Mecca, by a factor of five in fact, it is more significant than Kumbh Mela since the latter is only held every third year. In short, Arbaeen dwarfs every other rally on the planet reaching 20 million last year. That is a staggering 60% of Iraq's entire population and it is growing year after year. Above all, Arbaeen is unique because it takes place against the backdrop of chaotic and dangerous geopolitical scenes. Daesh, aka the ISIS, sees the Shia as their mortal enemy, so nothing infuriates the terror group more than the sight of Shia pilgrims gathering for their greatest show of faith. There is another peculiar feature of Arbaeen. While it is a distinctively Shia spiritual exercise, Sunnis, even Christians, Yazidis, Zoroastrians and Sabians partake in both the pilgrimage as well as serving of devotees. This is remarkable given the exclusive nature of religious rituals and it could only mean one thing. People, regardless of color or creed, see Hussein as a universal, borderless and meta-religious symbol of freedom and compassion. Who is this Hussein who motivates people to defy all the odds and come out to mourn his death 14 centuries after the fact? 570 AD, Arabian society is fueled with ignorance, with injustice, with tyranny and with cruelty. Injustice on the political level, injustice on the social level and injustice on the economic level. This man's grandfather, by the name of Muhammad, rises in Arabia. He is able to alleviate all these forms of injustice. The cruelty is removed. The tyranny has now vanished. He is able to establish principles by which every human being can live, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. Fifty years after Muhammad's death, the same ignorance returns. The same injustice has now returned. It's fueled the whole Arabian state. Tyranny everywhere, cruelty everywhere. Racism is now part and parcel of that society. A man must stand. A man must ensure that his grandfather and his message do not die. This man is known as Hussein. But this man, Hussein, recognizes that for this message to remain alive, he has to sacrifice his own life. Hussein is revered by Muslims as the Prince of Maritimes, or Sayyid al-Shuhada. He was killed in Karbala on a day which became known as Ashura, the 10th day of the Islamic month of Muharram, having refused to pledge allegiance to the corrupt and tyrannical caliph Yazid. He and his family and companions were surrounded in the desert by an army of 30,000, starved of food and water, then beheaded in the most macabre manner, a graphic tale recounted from pulpits every year since the day of he was slain. Their bodies were mutilated. In the words of the English historian Edward Gibbon, in a distant age and climate, the tragic scene of the death of Hussein will awaken the sympathy of the coldest reader. Shia Muslims have since mourned the death of Hussein, in particular on the days of Ashura, then 40 days later on Arbaeen. 40 days is the usual length of mourning in many Muslim traditions. An avalanche of men, women and children fill the eye from one end of the horizon to the other. The crowds were so huge that they caused a blockade for hundreds of miles. The 425 mile distance between the southern port city of Basra and Karbala is a long journey by car, but it's unimaginably arduous on foot. It takes pilgrims a full two weeks to complete the walk. People of all age groups trudge in the scorching sun during the day and in bone chilling cold at night. One part of the pilgrimage which will leave every visitor perplexed is the sight of thousands of tents with makeshift kitchens set up by local villagers who live around the pilgrim's path. The tents, called Maukeb, are places where pilgrims get practically everything they need. From fresh meals to eat and a space to rest, to free international phone calls to assure concerned relatives, to baby diapers, to practically every other amenity free of charge. In fact, pilgrims do not need to carry anything on the 400-mile journey except the clothing they wear. 
More intriguing is how pilgrims are invited for food and drink. Maokib organizers intercept the pilgrims' path to plead with them to accept their offerings, which often includes a full suite of services fit for kings. First you can have a foot massage, then you are offered a delicious hot meal, then you are invited to rest while your clothes are washed, ironed, then returned to you after a nap. All complimentary of course. Everything, including security, is provided mostly by volunteer fighters who have one eye on Daesh and another on protecting the pilgrims' path. To know what Islam teaches, don't look at the actions of a few hundred barbaric terrorists, but the selfless sacrifices exhibited by millions of Iranian pilgrims. It isn't easy for an outsider to understand what inspires the pilgrims. You see women carrying children in their arms, old men in wheelchairs, people on crutches, and blind seniors holding walking sticks. Visitors to the shrine of Hussein and his brother Abbas are not driven by emotion alone. They cry being reminded of the atrocious nature of his death and in doing so, they reaffirm their pledge to his ideals. The first thing that pilgrims do upon reaching his shrine is recite the Ziyara, a sacred text which summarizes the status of Hussein. In it, they begin the address by calling Hussein the inheritor of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. There is something profound in making this proclamation. It shows that Hussein's message of truth, justice, and love for the oppressed is viewed as an inseparable extension of all divinely appointed prophets. If the world understood Hussein, his message, and his sacrifice, they would begin to understand the ancient roots of Daesh and its credo of death and destruction. It was centuries ago in Karbala that humanity witnessed the genesis of senseless monstrosities epitomized in the murderers of Hussein. It was pitch black darkness versus absolute shining light, an exhibition of vice versus a festival of virtue, hence the potent specter of Hussein today. His presence is primordially wound into every facet of their lives. His legend encourages, inspires, and champions change for the better, and no amount of media blackout can extinguish its light. Who is this Hussein? For hundreds of millions of his followers, a question this profound which can cause people to relinquish their religion for another can be answered only when you have marched to the shrine of Hussein on foot.